Hello, you'll have to bear with me. The presentation will definitely fit on this screen because I uh, adjusted it for 700 and it's 1900. So I have a lot of extra space now. Um, so wh who am I? Well, I was already introduced just now. Uh, been doing a lot of stuff and most recently more path. Um, so why would somebody create a new web framework in 2014? I started in 2013. Um, well, I'm going to try to show you why you can still do new things with more or less traditional routing web frameworks. And in order to do so, I have to con contrast more, more path with other Python web frameworks. Um, so I'm going to do like a laundry detergent commercial, you know, when you, the stuff you put in your washer, uh, you put this white powder in, and in the traditional commercial for that, you have like the shiny box there, and you have the evil brand X, which really sucks. So, I'm going to be this annoying sales guy who is going to tell you all that the shining box is awesome, and brand X is horrible. Uh, so, yeah, Brand X, what do you mean with Brand X? Uh, Brand X is one of the popular routing web frameworks in Python that you probably use. I will not name them. Uh, and by this talk, you might learn something about Morpath, um, uh, but also more about Brand X, because the contrast works both ways. That might benefit you as well. Uh, and I really won't name Brand X. Okay. Uh, so it could be Bottle or Flask or Django or, 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 or Pyramid in its most common configuration, though Pyramid is kind of special. Well, they're all special and they all have their benefits. Uh, I'm not trying to put them down, I'm just contrasting. And of course, I'm going to say that Brand X sucks and I'm better with Morpath and all that, but... Uh, and Pyramid is especially special and I learn a lot from it. Who here uses a Brand X web framework? Like routing and views and stuff? Yeah, lots of people. So, a little bit about the Morpath origins. I won't go into this very deeply. So, there's this exploding planet Zoop, and <laughs> just at the last moment, they, they, they shoot out this, this, uh, 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 this sort of hero with superpowers. Uh, as long as you're not exposed to old pieces of the planet Zoop, right? That's really bad. Uh, so, they shoot it out. That's actually not the first thing they shot out. They already shot out a whole pyramid before. <laughs> It was only crumbling then, but you know, the pyramid people were a bit smarter. They saw the crumbles earlier. So they, but anyway, we just got out in time. It's okay. Um, and the Zo pieces are really easy to recognize because they sort of have this weird alien green glow. So it's, it's, it's simple. Anyway, so what are the goals of Morpath? Um, uh, Morpath is focused on the, um, on the modern web. And the modern web means REST, and it means rich JavaScript-based client-side applications run in the browser that use some kind of REST backend. And Morpath tries to be easy to develop with, to be powerful, so that when you are sort of trying to do something more sophisticated, you can still do it. And it tries to be small as well, because it needs, needed to be embedded in an existing system that, that didn't want to take too much on board. Um, so yeah, I claim that Morpath has superpowers. It looks like sort of this innocent Clark Kent guy who definitely doesn't have superpowers on the outside. So it looks like your average flask or something. And then, you know, he pulls open his shirt and then suddenly the superpowers come out. And it's important to realize that the superpowers of Morpath are not a different mode of working. Um, Clark Kent actually has those superpowers too. And doing the normal Clark Kent things, you know, routing and views and all that stuff in Morpath, automatically you sort of doing the super things is sort of doing more of the same. So you only need to learn the primitives that you don't need to learn something new in order to uh, use those superpowers. So I'm going to discuss three topics. I'm going to compare routing with Brand X. I'm going to compare linking, Morpath linking with uh, uh, Brand X. And I'm going to talk about reuse uh, in Morpath, like how you reuse code. So let's discuss routing. So we have a route, a URL path, and it goes to a, uh, a cat. If you're hoping for more beautifully drawn pictures, I didn't have enough time to, to make more, so we're going to get <laughs> boring slides now. Uh, so, um, you know, it takes time to draw that well. So anyway, uh, so we have a route to a, to, to, to a cat. Um, 
uh, and you know that sort of means get representation of an animal with the ID cat in a typical routing framework. And we have one extra requirement: if the cat ID does not exist in the database or whatever, then we want to get a 404 not found error from our web server. It's a pretty simple case. So. This is what you do in a sort of typical, I mean, this is hypothetical code, but it's sort of what you typically do in a brand, brand X framework. You declare some kind of route with a variable in there, it's ID there, and then ID is used in a function that does two things. It, it queries the database for an animal with that ID, and then it represents that animal, in this case with JSON, but you could be using a template or whatever. So, yeah, that looks simple. Uh, but we're actually not done. We haven't fulfilled our requirements. If we query an animal that, is, that the ID, with an ID that does not exist, if we're querying for a T-Rex and it's not in our database, then uh, we will get a, f a 400, a 500 error because it tries to find a T-Rex and maybe this thing returns none. All of many ORM mappers will return none, and then you try to get a title of none, and that doesn't work. And there's an exception, and the web server will make this into a 500 error. But that's not what you want from your API. You want a 404 error. So you have to add. Add code. You have to say, well, if there's nothing there, then you have to say, okay, we're going to return not found. Maybe you can do it an exception. Maybe you just return a response. So this is brand X routing with error handling. So this is more path routing. We split the code up into uh, two functions. If I knew I had 1900s horizontal, I would have put the first line on one line, but I thought I had much less available. Um, so, uh, but there's two functions. It's the same amount of lines of code if you write normal lines. You don't have, you have normal line length, it's the same amount of code. Uh, at least same amount of lines. Uh, so first you say, well, there's a path to a cat or to an animal. Uh, you have to say what kind of class you're going to return from that function first. That will be used later. Um, and then you do the query there, and then this returns either none or an animal object, an instance of animal. And then you have a way to represent that animal. You have a view, and you say, okay, this is the default way to represent an animal. Uh, you make its title. So you do the, you split it up like that. And uh, yeah, so it could first go to the model and then a view is looked up for the model. It's a two-step approach instead of a one-step approach. Now, a nice benefit of this that not, not, not found actually happens automatically because you, uh, this will return none, the first function, get animal, and then the system knows, oh wait, we don't have an animal to represent, then 404. Um, so you don't have to do anything special, you just work in the normal way, you get a 404. That's nice. Uh, and you can also have multiple named views for the same model. If you also want to have an edit view or whatever, you can give it a name and then uh, animal slash cat slash edit goes to the edit view. So this buys us, yeah, it's harder to do it wrong and because uh, it's easy to forget. Uh, it looks simple, but then you forget the special case. Um, and um, you get better linking. So now we go on to the next topic. So let's do a little rant about linking. So links make the web work, right? Traditional HTML websites work with links. Web applications work with links. REST worked with links. I mean, there was a talk about hypermedia APIs uh, on Tuesday, uh, talking about you know how useful it is for loose coupling and uh, scaling uh, uh, over multiple servers to use links and let you know your client follow links, just like somebody clicking on a link in a website. Um, so why then do brand, brand X web frameworks barely care about link generation? They do hardly anything. What they do is this. So uh, you have to give your route a name so you can refer to it later. Then you have to use that name and you generate a link somehow, you know, some API. And you have to know that an ID needs to go into the template of the URL to make the link work. So you have to know the name, introducing tight coupling between your routes and your code that uses the routes. So if you change the routes, you, you might have a problem. You don't want that tight coupling. Uh, I thought routes were for loose coupling, uh, so you could change things. And you have, to, uh, you have to know what parameters go in, and you have to extract that information from the object in order to put it in there. So yeah, I just discussed this. Uh, this is more path linking. So there's no change to our previous code. It just is exactly the same. Uh, and then you just have an animal object and then you say, give me a link to it. And that works for any object that we know how to make links for. Any object that has a route declared with a path uh, decorator will be linkable. And it's, this is loose coupling. You can just make a link to an object without knowing what it is, making it possible to write generic code that doesn't need to know about what kind of links you want to generate. 
And it's just easier. You don't have to remember all this stuff anymore. You just do it. So let's look about at linking with query parameters. So imagine instead of doing what we did before, we do slash animals, and then we have a query parameter in our URL. Uh, uh, it's called uh, ID, and then we give it a cat. It's very similar to the last case. Um, and of course, this is a bad example. It's a very simple example. That's why I put it there. A better example would be like some kind of filtering search API. Uh, the idea of URLs is that in a good RESTful web design or a traditional HTTP website, uh, the client does not construct any part of the URL except for the query parameters. So that's why I'm giving you this example here. Um, so um, yeah, you want to get a representation still the same. You want to get a 404 if it's not there, if you ask for the T-Rex. Uh, and if you don't supply the ID, well, the ID you want to assume some default, like, okay, the default animal is a cat. Why not, right? And, uh, or you want to say, no, there is no default. If you don't supply an ID, that's a bad request, and you want to get a bad request error from the system. So in Brand X, you do that like this. Um, you, you have to add another special case there. You have to say, okay, we, well, well, first you have to know that you have to extract this from the, from the request. You have to do that. And then you have to say, well, if it's not there, then we have to do something special. You have to do all that extra work. And your function is getting less simple. Um, so, uh, and if, yeah, if you were to have no default, then you want to raise a bad request. Now, Flask does automate that, actually. Uh, if you ask for something, it automatically raises, and that doesn't exist in your request parameters, where so it automatically raises bad requests. So that's kind of nice. But most of them, you, you have to implement it yourself. Um, in MoPath, this is the MoPath way to do that. So we've actually not changed the last three lines of the code at all. We've barely changed the top. The only thing is we've changed the URL path there to just slash animals. We've added the parameter to our get animal function, and we have given it a default there, like Python. And that will do this for us. So um, now you can just, uh, uh, so yeah, this is the same, so you don't need to do something special here. So now we can look at linking with query parameters. So in brand X, uh, in some frameworks, they have different things, but they don't do very much. Uh, it's, uh, so, so either you sort of refer to the route name, and then you give it some keyword parameters, and those will be added to the query parameters. Uh, or perhaps they recommend that in your template you start, you know, adding things there that's really ugly, uh, or you do it by hand, basically. They just sort of drop the ball on that, typically. Uh, they don't really think about query parameters very much, because after all, they're a fundamental mechanism for how the web works, so I would think about that, right? So, um, so in more part, it just works like that, like before. There's no change. This link will still generate a link. It just will generate one with the cat ID in there now, if you... If my animal happens to be a cat. Um, and MoPath also knows about the type of the parameter involved. So uh, if you give it the, if you say this, this parameter needs to be an int, and often it's enough to just give the default parameter and make that be an int, the system will assume, okay, well, this, this should be an int. So if you then give uh, something that cannot be converted to an int, a string, as a parameter, it will try to convert it, get a value error, and say, okay, wait, we cannot convert this. 400 bad requests, so we'll do that for you for free. And it will do that for all kinds of parameters. You can actually plug in your own, so, you, so by default it does dates and things like that, timestamps. Um, so that moves on from linking. I hope I've shown you that linking can be done better. Um, so let's look at reuse. Um, so MoPath offers a lot of facilities for, for, for reusing code. Because when web applications grow, or you have different pieces of app application you want to combine, or you have an application and it's perfect and it's developed by somebody else who just want to make a few changes, you want to do reuse and you want to make that easy. And more path reuse is not like a special case. You don't have to go to a special kind of subsystem and learn all these new things. Reuse is just there as part of the system. So let's talk about view reuse first. Um, so here we have a collection of animals that's maybe on slash animals, you know, without the cat bit, bit there. And we want to return some kind of JSON that has a, an array of animals, a list of animals. And instead of creating a list of links to animals, which we could have done with request link, we want to actually embed the information about the animal in the JSON. So we can just say, okay, give me the, the JSON representation, or at least the Python representation that translates to JSON for the animal. 
And it doesn't care what kind of animal it is. If you are doing, if, if you're getting a list of whatevers and you don't know what they are in this code, this code can be generic and still embed them or link to them. So that's view reuse. You can just reuse views. And there's again, you have loose coupling and you write generic code by default. And it's actually easier to write generic code by default. Um, so here we, are, we also have a generic view. So um, if you have a life form base class and you have an animal subclass that subclasses from, uh, from, from life form and you make a view for life form, that view will also exist for animals. It's just inheritance basically, right? So you can make a generic view for all life forms where you say, well, for elephants, we really want to add some extra information. You can make an exception. You say, okay, well, for elephants, we have this extra thing going on here. So you can do stuff like that. And that allows you, again, to write generic frameworks. You can write a generic collection-based class that then has a set of, set of generic views, and you just have to fill in a few details. And that sort of flows from the primitives of the system. You don't have to do something else and learn new things. Um, you can have more than one application. So a mobile application recently, actually, in the most recent release, became a class. Uh, and you just have two classes here. And then you can do all these paths and routes and stuff to the, uh, you can add them to the classes. Um, and they're independent from each other. So the, they don't interfere with each other, they don't share anything. So you can just have two of them. And that's actually very useful. Uh, um, but we'll see a little bit more of that later. First, we're going to talk about inheritance. You can also just inherit, you know, a derived application from a base application, meaning it will share everything with the base application. So you, you just get that. You don't have to, it's just Python, basically. But you're sharing everything, not just methods, but, you know, all these path registrations, all that stuff is also inherited. And then you could do overrides. So you can do extensions. Let's look at that. extensions first. You could say, well, the base, I mean, just inheritance is just copying. That's boring. You want to add something. So you could say, OK, in the derived application, everything is as the base application. But you have one extra view, you know, it's called so, slash animal slash cat slash extra, you know, and, and that does some extra thing for you. So you have the same application, but one extra little thing added, which is kind of nice. And you can think about framework applications that offer a sort of set of framework views that you can then reuse in multiple applications. You can do overrides, well, it's still, it's kind of like Python. So you have a base application here, and the base application has a default view uh, uh, for animal. But then you say, okay, well, our base application is great, all its routes, views are all great, we want to change one thing. Okay, you can do that. You can say, okay, I re-register re the default view for animal, then in the derived application, that's the view you'll get. But if you use the original application that's maybe maintained by somebody else who doesn't want that override, it will still work. It will still work as before. You can do composition of applications. So you have an application, a user application, and you have a, um, you have a wiki application and they're independently developed from each other, or maybe you are developing both of them, and you don't want to think about users when you develop wikis, and you don't want to think about wikis when you develop users. So you don't want to have a URL space with like users, you know, you don't want to have to, to think about, worry about users when you are developing the wiki URLs. So you just have two applications here. The one special thing we, we've done there is to say that the wiki application has a variable, expects to be, it's parameterized and it's parameterized with the wiki ID. You need to, in order to create a wiki application to instantiate it, you actually have to give it the wiki ID, otherwise it won't do anything. And they just are completely independent from each other. They, they just, one does a wiki and wiki pages and the other one does users. And now you want to combine them in each other. So you, you say, okay, we have the user application and we want there to be a slash wiki on every user that has the wiki. So you say, okay, we mount the wiki application onto the user application, and then we give it a, uh, this is the path where we want to mount it on, so we want to mount it on wiki, and then we have to say how to get the wiki ID from the context of the user application. So we know the username, and we need to have some way to find the wiki ID for a username. You look it up in some database, but that, that's only in the mounting code. The wiki doesn't need to care about user names anymore, and they, you can merge them together. Um, you actually still have access to the username if you want to in the, in the wiki application. Um, so MorePath has a bunch of other features I won't go into details about here. Um, there's a built-in identity and permission system. Um, so you can protect um, views with permissions and you can define rules uh, for your, your specific system, saying models of this kind, like animals, uh, um, they, uh, people only have the edit permission if they, you know, this table in the database says so, 
whatever. You can just do whatever rules you want. It's a very flexible system. It doesn't assume anything, so the basic core of MoPath doesn't make many assumptions, but it does let you to, to come up with whatever rules are appropriate to your application. Um, MoPath is extensible with new view predicates. We've really only seen the name predicate where you have multiple names views. Uh, those are get requests, but you can also make a post a request for the post view, so you can have request method that's built in. But you can extend it to say, okay, this view only matches when the HTTP accept header in the request says this and this. So you can add, extend to that in sort of the normal MoPath way with a few decorators. Um, it's also extensible with new converters. If your application has a specific, you know, data type, like a car or whatever, and you, you have a way to represent it in the URL, uh, you can define a converter for it uh, to just parse that uh, and also convert it back again from a car object to, to a representation that you can use in your URL, either in your path or in your request parameters. And you can extend more path itself. So you can say, uh, um, I mean, I haven't documented this, so it's sort of a, a special thing, but a more path application is a bunch of generic functions. You can actually override those generic functions in your application. So if you don't like the way more path does routing or whatever, you can actually override little bits and it's sort of using the same mechanism to implement more path that more path sort of allows you to, to override and extend it. Um, MoPath does have a few extensions. I have a more.transaction extension that I sort of uh, copied from the pyramid uh, version of that. Um, that basically lets you, uh, it integrates with the transaction module and the transaction module integrates with SQL Alchemy and ZDB and whatever else sort of has, uh, uh, integrates with that. And that lets, that automatically commits when a, when a request is handled, unless there was an error or you're returning, you know, explicit status code that indicates error, then it will not commit the transaction, well, abort the transaction. So that's uh, uh, kind of a nice feature to integrate these systems in a general way. And recently I released uh, more.static, which is an uh, extension that uh, um, adds the ability to publish static uh, resources like um, um, JavaScript files and CSS files in a cache-friendly way, but also in a developer-friendly way, busting the cache when you need it um, to the web. Um, and it sort of plugs in as a whiskey middleware. It, it's similar to Fanstatic, but it's oriented around, around the Bower tool. So you can use the Bower tool to install these JavaScript libraries, and then you can just start using them without having to do any extra special work to, um, to wrap them. It's similar to Fanstatic, uh, but there you need to do that extra work. Uh, and all this stuff is documented. Well, some of the, uh, extending a more path itself is not documented, but extend, uh, the rest of that is all documented on more path with docs.org. Uh, I just checked the PDF uh, version of the documentation and it's about 90 pages, so I did end up writing quite a bit. Um, let's look a little bit at performance, like maybe there's a huge performance cost uh, that makes more path very slow, but I did a, I mean, it's benchmarks, right? I did a very simple hello world benchmark and it's raw whiskey calls. There's no real whiskey server there and more path, well, it's, 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 it's sort of in the middle. Some systems are a lot faster, but of course in reality, when you look at the real web application, the overhead of actually implementing your stuff, like doing the database uh, interaction or generating views is gonna be so much higher than the web framework, it's negligible. But I just wanted to check that more path is not ridiculously slow and it's not. It's faster than, than Flask, but a lot slower than Bottle. So. Um, code size, like maybe more path is enormous. It's like, whoops, Zoop. Um, and uh, no, it's not. I, I checked and I was kind of surprised that uh, more path, depending on how you measure it, is smaller than Bottle. Uh, though if you realize that Bottle has no dependencies whatsoever, I don't know what, why they don't have... Um, yeah, I don't see the reason not to use dependencies, but more paths, a few dependencies, if you add them all up, it's about, uh, well, it's gonna be smaller than Flask, or the, definitely, or don't call the code, code base. Uh, Reg is, is sort of the main library that more path depends on, which is sort of a rewrite of the old Zoop component architecture in terms of generic functions. The tests, I excluded the tests and the doc strings in measuring this, the tests are a lot bigger than the actual code that's being tested, which is how it should be. Yeah, we, WO is web op and ZI is Zoop interface. I didn't list all the dependencies and WZ is, is rec. So I would have spelled it all out if I had nine, if I knew I had 1900 horizontal instead of 756 or something. Um, conclusion. So, um, yeah, I hope to have shown that routing and link generation and reuse in more path is better than your brand X. 
uh, more path tries to be, and I hope I've shown that more path is both easy to use, right? It's not much harder than Flask. It's not so intimidating. Uh, and at the same time, very powerful in its reuse and override and potential like that. And it's also still small, so it's not intimidating in sort of what's there. And I hope I didn't make you frustrated with brand X that you may be using. So, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, that's what happens when you. That's what happens when you wash your tiger with Brand X, right? Yeah. Um, Martin, thanks for a very. If you have questions, will you go to one oh. of the mics, please? Yes. Oh. Ah. Um, so thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, the, what, are, what is the kind of status and also the outlook or so? Is it kind of like stabilizing and you think that the next things are going to like happen within, I mean, what, is, what are your next plans basically with that, right? So, because there's also the question of if you start to use it now, sure. to what changes do you need to adapt? Um, it's a, you know, right. So uh, maybe a few weeks ago, I thought it was pretty stable. It was not going to change in any massive way. And then I decided to make applications classes instead of instances, which was a rather big way, though not a high burden for a developer to actually adjust any code in. I mean, that, that was not. So I don't think there's going to be any changes that make give you a huge problem if you start developing with it now. My plans are mostly involving writing extensions for it, like uh, you know, looking at some of these RESTful standards for, for making links to things, building it on top of more path, not growing more path itself. There's also a lot of sort of potential for writing an extension that sort of uh, re-implements some of the pyramid authenticators, the ticket-based authentication, but that's all extension, that's not core stuff. Um, so. I don't think I'm going to change it very much anymore, but you never know. And in three weeks' time, I have some brilliant idea. But I, even then, I don't think it's going to be a giant burden on whoever has a code base then. So it's, it's getting pretty stable, I think. We are starting to use it ourselves in our own project now. So people are starting building real world in my customer project, uh, real world code with it. So it's ready, I think, yeah. Thank you. If there are any more questions, can you take them over there? We'll get the next speaker. Okay, sure. If the next speaker can come and set up, please. And Martin will take any more questions. Are you, uh, Apple man.